Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a very, very, very special of Red Pill Tamales. I'm your host, Chingo Bling. We have producer Rob in the building. What's up, everybody? Today we have a special guest, man. Um, 30-year veteran of the United States Border Patrol, Roy Villarreal. And uh, before, let me just set it up like this before we dive in and say hello. Um, as you all know, there is a situation on the border. Um, as many of you know, I am Mr. They Can't Deport Us All. So the last thing people, some people would expect is Chingo interviewing La Migra, right? <laughs> but here's what we're out to do, man. We want to find solutions. Um, there is a, a real, real situation happening on our southern border. Um, you know, I just had to block a bunch of people on my Facebook because people calling me out trying to say, oh, where were you a year ago? And are you, wait, you mean to tell me that Biden's building more cages? And wait, you mean to tell me now it's a crisis and it wasn't previously? And my thumbs are sore having to tell everybody there was a thing called the maintain in Mexico policy, which is when Trump had to get with Mexico and say, hey man, you got to pitch in, help us out. We need to control this influx and keep these numbers down and keep, you know, don't incentivize people to take this four month long uh, voyage, uh, unaccompanied children, where it just benefits cartels, uh, human traffickers. It is a huge mess. I can't wait to get into it. Yeah. But uh, Mr. Villarreal, thank you for what you do. Uh, where are you uh, talking to us from? Oh, good morning. And thank you for having me on. I'm actually out in uh, Tucson, Arizona. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. How far is that from the border? How far is Tucson from the border? So Tucson itself is about 70 miles north of the border. Wow. Okay. So I, I believe Yuma is more of the border town. Yeah. So when you look at Arizona and you look at the Southwest border in Arizona specifically, Yuma is uh, maybe 12 miles from the border. And then in Tucson, and the way the border patrol is set up is it's got uh, tw 20 sectors throughout the, the entire United States, nine of which are on the Southwest border. And so in Arizona, you've got the Yuma sector, which is comprised of Yuma, San Luis, um, Algodones, and then you've got Tucson sector, which is the rest of Arizona, which in includes um, Ajo, Nogales, Douglas, Agua Prieta, <clears throat> and then everything in, into northern Arizona. Awesome. So how could we explain to folks um, the, I guess, the change that we've seen with this new administration? Because a lot of people know that I pick on the new administration a lot. So um, I'm going to just try to be as unbiased as possible. But what is the current situation? What's happening? But, you know, it's interesting you mentioned trying to be unbiased. And, and um, when we talk about the Border Patrol, the Border Patrol, regardless of the administration, Trump, Biden, Bush, Clinton, so Republican, Democrat, it really doesn't matter. It's got a, the core mission of border security. And uh, when you look at the border and the dynamics of the border, there are all kind of things that are happening at the border every day. Good, bad, more bad than good. <clears throat> and right now, uh, under the Biden administration, it's it's really an administration that's missing in action. Unfortunately, a lot of what the administration has done is uh, reversed or dismantled a lot of the enforcement tools and apparatuses that were put into play by the, the Trump administration that, it, for the most part, quelled or brought the, the border under control. And, and I understand what Biden's trying to do, but the unfortunate part is, and this is what I think... Uh, people need to understand is when you look at border patrol or border enforcement, it's uh, we're not unilateral on how we look at it. We're, you know, we're, we're not so myopic that we say it's just got to be border enforcement. We have to stop everything. The reality is the border is so dynamic that, that what goes hand in hand is legal migration and then border security. You can't have one without the other. And what Biden is trying to do right now is bolster up the, the legal aspect but he's undermining the security aspect. And what that's doing is it's creating this pool. Um, the, the messaging that's being sent into Mexico, Central America, and actually throughout the entire world, because I, I talk to agents every day, is that now is the time to come to the United States. And so you've got this huge surge that's taken place. And uh, what we're seeing at the border right now are a lot of children. And uh, so, the Border Patrol uses the term unaccompanied children, and that's uh, children that are up to the age of 17. The majority of these, I would say probably 40, maybe even 50 percent are 15 to 17 year old young men. And then the rest are everything from newborns up to that age of you know, 17. I, I've seen uh, little kids, a 10 year old with her little brother who's six years old and their little sibling who's two or three years old show up at the border. And then you've got families that show up and because right now what they're, they're understanding is that if I 
come to the border as a child. I'll be detained for a short period of time, and then I'm going to be released in the United States. So I'm, re I'm reunited with family members, whether it's dad or mom or Theo or Thea. <clears throat> and as a family, it's the same principle. I show up, I spend a couple of days, maybe a couple of days in detention, and then released in the United States. So from that perspective right now, there's a, a short-term impact for a long-term gain, i.e. show up, present myself, be detained, and I'm released in the U.S., um, given uh, support, uh, whether that's state or federal support, and then I'm giving a, a temporary um, employment authorization and the ability to work, and I won't be assigned a hearing for years. Mm. Uh, the average right now, the delay is, I think a quick hearing would be three years, but the average delay is about five years. So in that time frame, you have the ability to work, to live, to establish a family, and whether or not they show up for the hearing is another issue. Go ahead. To try to be as like you know bipartisan as possible, what is the best way to demystify what it was from the previous administration to this administration to anybody who is a little bit on the younger side and really rooting for these uh, what they think are really progressive social causes when it comes to differentiating the differences between what's happening now and what was happening just two years ago yeah so it, the unfortunate part is with the trump administration border security or migration illegal migration i mean there's a clear distinction between the two became so politicized that now you sit either on the far left or the far right and the ability to have a conversation has been completely washed away and, and so I, I mean i appreciate this opportunity because we as a country really need to focus on how we address this and so it's so complex um <clears throat> I, I think the best way to describe this is you have to look at this from this perspective there is a legal mechanism to migrate to the united states and so when we talk about those folks that are applying for visas uh, applying for immigrant status there's a legal process and the reason you see people that come through illegally those are the folks that are not coming at the port of entry or flying into the u.s or acquiring legal doc documents uh, those are the folks that the u.s border patrol contends with they either don't qualify they don't have the financial means to apply for um, legal status or they're simply unaware i.e there, there isn't a lot of information that's that flows into these communities so they know how to apply. And I think the bigger issue is time. Nobody wants to wait a year or three years to get a non-immigrant visa or an immigrant visa when they need to feed their family today. So for me, the, the you know, when I speak about this, whether it's Trump or Biden, whoever is in control, my, my main message is something needs to be done and it needs to be done immediately, but it has to be comprehensive. We have to focus on the legal migration aspect and we have to focus on the security aspect if you can fix the legal part if you can make it easy to apply if you can make uh the number of visas bigger uh, you know a larger pool of, of potential then that lessens the burden on the u.s border patrol on the folks that are working at the ports of entry because now you're really focused on the criminals those that are really trying to come into the country illegally or those that have criminal backgrounds and want to harm us so you're taking away a lot of the noise and clutter by opening that legal avenue. So if, if, whether it's Biden or whoever, if they can do this where they can do comprehensive immigration reform, I think we have a, a, a much more secure border. We have legal migration and we take away a lot of the, the bad stuff that comes with this. Uh, and when I say bad, I'm talking about the cartels. Um, let's say, uh, uh, anyone who thinks that cartels do not control the border is just mistakenly naive about the real world. This is a multi-billion dollar industry. A Mexican national is gonna pay $2,500 to $5,000 to be smuggled into the US. Someone from Central America, it's $5,000 to $10,000. Someone from the Middle East, uh, former Soviet Union, is going to pay anywhere from $10,000 to $30,000. Uh, Indian, Pakistani, Chinese, Assyrian is gonna pay fifty dollars to $100,000. There's a lot of money being generated by illegal migration through the cartels. And even if they're not handling it door to door, i.e., you know, they, they, uh, Chinko shows up and he says, hey, I, I want to be smuggled into the U.S., you can get packages where they fly you from India into the routes that go all over the United States, India into Brazil, into Mexico City, and then to the border. And it's, it's, it's almost like a tourist package. You know, they're going to move you all around, get you to the border, and then cross you over. Even if you're not part of that door-to-door -door service and you just show up at the border and want to cross on your own, 
you're gonna you're gonna be charged a, a tax. The cartel controls each each uh, segment along the border has a plaza boss. And so when you show up at the border and you think I'm just gonna walk across, you're mistaken. Somebody's gonna char- is gonna charge you, whether it's a hundred dollars or up upwards of $800, depending upon where you're crossing, because you draw attention to that segment of the border, which then means that passing narcotics through there gets tougher because now the border patrol is responding and heightening their posture. So they're going to charge you a tax, and then they're going to control when you're able to cross the border. So it's it's just, it's, um, it's a criminal enterprise. There's a lot of money in it. Um, the commodity is human beings. There's no care for the children for a family you're just simply a commodity <clears throat> um, and so what troubles me the most and having i've done this for 32 years or retired after 32 years i've witnessed um a complete transition when i came into the border patrol and, and it's funny you, you mentioned you know la migra mm-hmm. but migra was the term back in the days in the eight, late 80s early 90s and we were the bad guys mm-hmm. nobody wanted to contend with the migra there was just a lot of uh, misinformation and maybe some of it was, was earned based on past um, agents and how they conducted themselves. But a lot of the migrants were fearful of the border patrol. There was a sense of heavy handedness and these tough guys that were going to hurt you. And, you know, there's corridas and songs out there about uh, La Mira. Then you fast forward to you know, 2014 and uh, right before I retired, I was down at the border. It was a mom from Honduras, uh, three little girls, I'm sorry, two little girls with her. And uh, I could see the, this sense of relief, this look on her face. Like she sees the green uniform, she walks up, and it's just this stress and this pressure just washes away. And she starts crying, and she walks up, and I'm talking to her just to get an idea what's going on. And her little girls wrap their, their arms around my legs, and they're crying. And what it was was the meager way from being this bad, these bad people to I've made it to the United States, and now I know I'm safe. I'm not going to be mistreated. I'm not going to be abused. I'm going to be taken care of. And now my journey in the United States takes starts here with the Border Patrol. So there's this huge transition as it relates to a lot of the community that we're dealing with. Um, but, uh, you know, overall, when, when you look at this, I think what we have to remember is we need a legal process. Um, the, if anything, if this pandemic has taught us anything, because if you go back to the origins of immigration a lot of what it was designed for was to prevent the introduction of disease into the united states and so you know ironically here we are 2020 2021 with the pandemic and the posture at the border right now is about present preventing the entry of people into the u.s who may either have covid or will spread covid because the key thing with that and and some people think wow that's really horrible you know you're, you're keeping these people out but every country has a finite capability to address medical needs and if you look at places uh, like this happened in San Diego, it happened in uh, El Centro, Calexico, Mexicali area, where their medical systems were completely in, inundated and overrun by people that were coming in from Mexico, legal and some illegal, and then the community themselves. <laughs> so it's kind of it's it's uh, interesting that it's gone full circle with de- uh, preventing the entry of disease to immigration enforcement back to now it's a combination of both. And I think as COVID begins to wane and, and disappears, uh, we'll be focused again on the illegal migration part. I have a question about, you mentioned that the cartels have different plazas all along the border, and they're very involved in this multi-billion dollar, multi-billion dollar industry of human trafficking and, and drugs, et cetera. What type of presence would you say that the Mexican government has along that same stretch of border like is it just the cartels running everything or is it the cartels working in cahoots with the mexican government or is the mexican government just not even present it's it's yes all of the above so the the mexican government part of the problem that the mexican government has is they don't have a a designated border security uh team um grupo beta under uh, enami um is sort of their border enforcement team but they don't have law enforcement uh, authority so they're really aiding migrants. And then you have to look at the Mexican constitution. The, the Mexican constitution is written in such a manner that it prohibits the government from impeding the movement of their people. So as a Mexican national, if you want to come to the border and you want to cross into the U.S. illegally, the Mexican government cannot stop you. Well, they can uh, intervene as it relates to smuggling and trafficking. 
it's specifically that smuggling traffic, but really it's for non-Mexican nationals. So th there's there's a lack of uh, of a true uh, Mexican border enforcement effort, and they've gone through a, a series of of um, reinventing the government, Mexican government. To they went from a Name Grupo Beta to the uh, federal police to the uh, the, the uh, this was a force that they were standing up in the last couple of years. So they're just all over the place. And then very recently, well, not recently, when I say recently, I'm talking about within the last decade, the Mexican military has assumed a very active role along the border, but their focus is specifically narcotics. And, and one of the things, and I'll mention this and I'll get back to your question, uh, Chico, is when we think about what happens in the U.S., we're, we're very um, myopic and, and, and selfish to an extent because we're concerned about what's coming into the U.S., you know, illegal aliens, um, narcotics, disease, we're, you know, we're focused on those things, but we don't think about what goes back into Mexico. And so with this multi-billion dollar industry, you know, there's money that comes in or is being generated that's being sent into Mexico. There are weapons that are going into Mexico. So as a partner with the Mexican government, we've been very short, short sighted because we've just focused on ourselves. And in the last three to five years under, under the Trump administration, there was this, um, sort of an awakening in dealing with the Mexican government, particularly the, the military, where they said, hey, you know, we really want you guys to help us because we need to stop the flow of the money coming back into the country. We need to stop the flow of the weapons and the ammunition uh, and these bad people. You help us do that, and then it helps you. And so there's, you know, when you think about the border being dynamic, we always focus on the economics and the people and the culture, but we never focus on the aspect, and this is where the cartels thrive and do so well, is because they're not focused on a border. You know, the, the line between the U.S. and Mexico means nothing to them. That money flows across both ways, as does the crime. <clears throat> so going back to your question, you know, with the Mexican government, there's there's the aspect of a lack of true authority, one designated entity that's in charge of border enforcement, a multi-billion dollar industry, and then we have to look at culture. Um, you know, going back, it's improved tremendously, but 10, 20 years ago, you know, I, I knew dealing with the Mexican government and any of the officials that I was dealing with someone who was probably corrupt. You know, uh, what's uh, what's the, the saying, the uh, el plumo plata, you know, you, you take the lead or you take the money, right? <clears throat> it, it was a part of the culture that was accepted that you were just, you were going to uh, bolster your your uh, your pay, your, excuse me, your wages by taking a mordida. Um, and so that's still a true reality. And it's so far reaching. So at one point I was uh, working in Mexico City. I was assigned down there. And um, I befriended the, uh, he was the number three person in what's, what would be Mexico's uh, CIA, CSEN at the time. Wonderful individual. Um, and they were focused again on the cartels and the power that they had. And uh, working with him, <clears throat> his whole focus was rooting out corruption. And so after working in Mexico City, I was sent down to Yuma, Arizona, and I had given him a call and said, hey, I've got a problem with what's going on down here. And it was 2004, and the level of migration was just out of control. There were We had something like uh, almost 3,000 vehicles drive right across the border, loaded with people, with dope, you name it, high-speed pursuits, shootings. It was just, it was almost like the, the wild, wild west. And I called him up and I asked for some help, and he showed up with a, a vetted team. And this is one of the things that Mexicans, uh, we ask of the Mexican government is send a vetted team. And vetted means that they've been cleared. We're sure we're fairly certain they're not corrupt or haven't been corrupted. And so this team shows up. It's a vetted team of 100. And um, they go into the city of San Luis and just kicking in doors, knocking stuff down. And, and it's a 72-hour operation. And he shows up and he, he hands me dossiers on all of the Mexican officials that I've been working with for the last year or so. And virtually all of them are corrupt, making somewhere between three to ten thousand dollars a month in mordida and uh so it's it's a reality of of uh dealing with with mexico i mean they're working towards improving it but when their wages are so poor and culturally it's so accepted and, and accepted plus there's also the threat you know if, if you don't take that mordida which uh my friend uh he was eventually assassinated um you, horrendous assassination out, out outside of his front door mm -hmm. um and you know and, and the way they send the message there is it's one thing to be killed but it's another thing once you're shot to to shoot you in the face and they walked up and shot him in the face just to send a clear message 
Um, so you're contending with that. You know, it's for Mexico to improve it. It has to root out that corruption. It has to focus on border security. Um, but and you know, as we deal with it, or I should say, as uh, now that I'm retired, those that are carrying this on with the border patrol, you always deal with it, recognizing that there's probably some degree of corruption, and you're always concerned about the information that you're exchanging. Very interesting. Um, what? Not, not to off the top of your head, you know, if you know any of these numbers, but um, would you say that there's been a drastic increase, you know, based on the messaging and whatever other factors? But, um, you know, would you say there's been like a huge jump in the numbers from, uh, you know, the influx? Yeah, so there's, there's, so there's, there's a number of arguments to this under, um, excuse me, under the Trump administration. And one of the things that uh, troubled me the most is, as I said, I've worked for multiple administrations. And when you look at bolstering border enforcement, it started under the Democrats with Bill Clinton. Um, I, I was very fortunate to work with Janet Reno, then Attorney General, uh, when they began to focus on border enforcement, and that was under Bill Clinton's administration under the Democrats. So they they started the investment into the fencing and the technology and the, and the recruitment and bolstering of the border patrol, and then it's just it's continued since there. So when we look at the numbers today, have they increased? Absolutely. Um, I just got off a phone call this morning, and um, they're in. And I won't disclose the location because there's there's security issues with it. But there's a um, a facility in Texas that's that's been erected to handle the influx of unaccompanied children. And today there are two thousand children sitting in that facility. And there are another two thousand that uh, are waiting to be uh, processed into that facility. Plus, at the stations, at one point they were holding close to five thousand kids. Mm. So it's. Yes, yeah, so have the numbers increased? Absolutely. And then on top of that, you've got family units. And this is sometimes it's just mom and, a, and a, uh, some kids. Sometimes it's mom and dad and kids. You've got family units that are now showing up at the border in greater numbers. And what makes it problematic? And um, so I, I want to drive this point home. When, when we look at border enforcement, uh, a lot of what we do is the Border Patrol. You know, we're looking for the bad guys. Nobody gets a thrill out of arresting a child or a family. It's, you're really looking for that bad guy, and, and it's, it's the guy that's bringing in fentanyl and coke and meth, the guys that are wanted for murder and have warrants and stuff like that. That That's the thrill that you're looking for. It's not the little kid or the family. Because when you're dealing with them, you're dealing with a vulnerable population. And so you, you go from being a, a law enforcement officer to a nurse and a social worker. Um, Babysitter. But, Babysitter, yeah, but the numbers have increased so dramatically. So right before I retired here in Tucson sector, about 40% of my workforce was dedicated to just the care and well-being of children and family units. And so when you think about that, you're like, well, yeah, it's 40%, but that's, you still got 60% of your workforce. I've got 260, I had 260 miles of border that I, that I had to contend with. And a lot of people mistakenly, when they think about the border, they think about, san diego or el paso an urbanized area <clears throat> come out to arizona it's wide open desert um, arroyos and canyons and mountains and there are areas of the border where <clears throat> and this is one of the things that the talk about the cartels one of the things that they would do is they would charter buses and they would put 100 to 300 families and, and kids into these buses drive them along the mexican uh, highway too on the mexican side there's access to the border on the u.s side other than the cities between the, the cities, this, it's wide open desert. And it could be a short walk of about 15 miles upwards of 80 miles to any sort of infrastructure. The cartels on the, on the Mexican side will drive these buses up, drop these families and these kids off in the middle of the desert, knowing that now the border patrol has to allocate all of its resources in order to get these kids and the families out of the desert. Because if you don't do it, what's gonna happen? They're ill-prepared, they don't have water, they're vulnerable, they're, they're going to be getting sick and, or dying. And, and so it's one of their tactics in order to, to draw us away. But when you've got such a large workforce focused on the care, well-being, babysitting, you can't do border enforcement. So what happens? They start smuggling the coke, the meth, you know, uh, you, you get your, your um, there, there are other folks that, you know, for lack of a better term, our, our security risk to our country. You know, they come from countries that, that are intent on hurting us. And so when you create this diversion, then you can run these things through areas where you, you think the border patrol is not going to be. Um, one thing that I get a lot when I bring up the subject 
when I post things on social media um, about all these issues that you're mentioning, whether it's um, human trafficking, cartels, you know, women and children, uh, fentanyl, um, just the threat to our sovereignty, uh, the fact that we're in a pandemic and so on. People like to hit me with, oh, yeah, Chingo, well, why don't you help and go to those facilities and donate supplies and this, that and the third. Um, what for people that say that, what are the options? Can anybody just show up down to um, down to Texas with you know blankets and cases of water? Or, or what can people what's the information for people that ask things like that? So, uh, you know, I, it's one of the things that troubled me, but unfortunately, the government can't accept donations. So they're, they're, that's one aspect. The government uh, has the, is unable to accept these donations. Um, you can do it through look for nonprofits um, or church organizations, and you can send these. You know, if you want to donate water, toys, clothes, your time or money, you can donate it to these organizations. Because what happens is once these people are processed <clears throat> and released. We were, we're in contact and communication with a lot of these non-government organizations and these church groups because we recognize that we you can't simply turn over 100 people a day or 1,000 people a day in a community and expect the community to absorb them. And these people also need help. So we work with a lot of these, these individuals to provide that support once they're released from custody and, and, and help them migrate to wherever they're going in the u.s the other aspect is and one of the things i hear because just a few weeks ago a friend of mine wanted to donate toys and crayons and all kind of stuff and and i think it's wonderful but one of the things that, that uh, people don't think about is unfortunately for all the good people out there you know one or two bad people who um may not agree with migration and may introduce something that's tainted you know, uh, something that's dangerous, something that uh, could be disease uh, prone. Um, and then, you know, we accept it and we give it to somebody and, and then they get sick or ill. Plus, there's the other, uh, other aspect of, you know, with, with toys and you're dealing with little kids from infant all the way up to 17. You know, there's a liability of if you give a teddy bear and the button pops off and the child swallows it. So there, there's just so many concerns, unfortunately. But I, I think the key thing is, look for reputable organizations that are servicing these populations and work through them. And that's, that's probably the best way that you can support uh, the people that are migrating to the U S. Well, let me ask you this, in your opinion, how can either this administration or just the United States in general, what can they do to not be such a disservice to the population as far as the information they're sharing on the news or on interviews or on radio or anything? What, in your opinion, if you were the one whispering in their ears, like, hey, maybe don't say that, say this instead so that it's not so black or white. You know, you, you believe one thing and it's only that thing. And if we say an, another thing, it's completely wrong. Like what needs to be said so there's a better understanding for the regular Joe Schmo walking down the street? <laughs> so let's start with this. If anybody in the administration is out there, give me a call. I will help you. <laughs> uh, I certainly want to find a way to make this better. And it, it starts with messaging. You're absolutely correct. Um, right now, the messaging message and it's leaning towards uh, and, and i get it uh, the biden administration wants to be welcoming they, you know they want to they want to be the the counter to what the the previous administration was but doing so they're, they're creating this huge vulnerability um, you know if you're going to do this you need to do it right and i think the messaging is key and the message needs to be there are legal mechanisms to come to the u.s and we're working on improving these these mechanisms so it's 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 greater opportunity. Uh, it's safer to do so. But be, from now until we get it ready, we need you to stay where you're at. Um, they need to talk about the dangers along the border. And one of the bigger issues, um, if you haven't noticed, uh, take a look. So during the Trump administration, you probably would have saw a lot of the border chiefs and border patrol making public statements uh, going on CNN, Fox, you know, news stations doing regular interviews. You're not seeing them do that now. Right. So the messaging is being controlled right now. Um, and a lot of what's out of, it's out of sight, out of mind. So <clears throat> the key thing is going to be proper messaging. Send a very deliberate and clear message. You know, if, if your goal is to improve legal migration, say that, but also say specifically, you cannot come today. And then you need to bolster that. You need to stand behind that. So as it relates to I think at the beginning of, of our conversation, we were talking about MPP and, and uh, the agreements with Central America. You know, 
very innovative. Um, it was done by, by President Trump because he didn't have support of Congress. He took a lot of actions on his own, executive uh, actions, but he helped quell that flow of migration. One of the things that's been lost in this conversation is the term asylum has been hijacked. Not everyone coming to the border is, is truly qualified as an asylum seeker or a refugee. They're certainly not refugees. That is a distinct category in and of itself. As an asylum seeker, the majority of these individuals aren't, aren't going to qualify. And the system is set up in such a manner that when you first present yourself, the threshold or the bar to, to, to get into the ballpark for applying for asylum is so broad that you, all three of us would, would uh, qualify for it. You know, it's simply a statement of, I'm concerned about my country and my safety there. Okay, you, you mm-hmm. met the first threshold. But as you progress through the, the interview process, um, something like uh, 90%, and, and do your research on this, but something like 90% of these folks do not qualify for asylum. A lot of folks are coming here for the, the economic uh, opportunities that the U.S. presents. Uh, when you look at the, the GDP in Mexico and Central America, in their top 10, if not in the top five, remittances from the U.S., i.e., you know, Mexican nationals that are working here sending money back to Mexico, is in their top 10 of their GDP. Uh, so when you talk about uh, the inability to stem this flow, part of that fact is because there's so much money going back into the country, into these sending countries, that the countries don't want to stop it either. So we have to work on the messaging, but it gets back to what I was talking about earlier, the legal migration part. We really need, we as in the government, um, and I think if I was going to place a lot of blame on on an individual entity, it would be Congress. Congress has the power of the purse and the ability to legislate, and they have sat on the sidelines for far too long. This could be addressed very, very quickly. Um, Like literally, literally decades, right? They've been sitting on the sidelines for literally decades. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and like the situation today, and I apologize because I took that long pregnant pause because I get frustrated thinking about this, but over the last four years, Congress, uh, part of today's problem, and, and it frustrates me because I keep on hearing about, well, the administration inherited a broken system. <laughs> that system, that system was being dismantled by Congress. So as an example, ICE had something like 65,000 detention beds, had contracts for housing children. What Congress did was they reduced that funding. So they went from 65,000 beds down to something like 30,000 beds. They stopped the funding for contracted facilities. Um, <clears throat> recognizing that the dynamics of, of the population, i.e. we went from just single adults to now families and kids, we should have been prepared. And, and I say we, again, because I'm talking very generically, or general about the U.S. government. <clears throat> Border Patrol, ICE, a lot of these folks, when we talk to our elected officials, we say, hey, look, the demographics, demographics have changed. Our facilities were not designed for this demographic. We need to make an investment. We need to change either our facilities or we need to contract and uh, get facilities that are suited for families and kids. So rather than earmark that, the money for that, what Congress has done over the last four years is simply just taken the money away, reduced it. So there have been zero improvements. And then here we are 2021 with this, another crisis happening and the government is scrambling. And so, you know, we heard the kids in cages to now it's, I forget what the the official term is. It's children's centers or something like that. It's one of the same, nothing has changed. Maybe they put a, one of my my friends who's working down in South Texas said, yeah, we, we put up a sheet on on the fencing so that it looks nicer, but it's the same facility, you know, and, what the, what the Biden administration is doing today is um, they are contracting and building out. Um, they're not calling they're they're not detention facilities. They are uh, reception centers, and so family units are being shuttled from once they're released from the border patrol or ICE into these reception centers. Uh, a lot of them are hotels. The facilities for children. Uh, there are a number of them uh, in Texas right now have been designed. So what you're seeing is. As this flow, increased flow of uh, illegal migration is happening, a lot of these folks are being processed as quickly as possible by the Border Patrol and then shuffled into these these locations. And at these locations, they're provided with medical care, um, social and uh, 
mental support and then they're they're aided in their travel so you know if, if i'm going to new york city and whether i have a family member there who can arrange for my travel or if not maybe the, the organizations are helping them with their travel so it, it's kind of rather than fix the problem and it gets back to messaging what they're doing right now is simply really delivering this message because what's hap what happens with this i come in here illegally i get help for a few days i go to a reception center i get all this help what am i going to do i'm calling home you know i'm telling my neighbor i'm the, the scene i'm telling my cousins and things you know what this is what happened now is the time to come before it changes so we're going to see this just continually increase and increase to the point i, I think unfortunately you know, when i started in the border patrol in 1988 we were arresting over a million and a half people a year. Um, it's it had been decades since we even got close to that. In 2019, the Border Patrol uh, arrested, I think it was just under 800,000 people. And it had been probably two, a decade or more since they had seen numbers of, of that magnitude. This year, and probably next year, if this continues, we're going to see, we will be in the million plus very easily. So a couple things that, that we've touched upon that fall under solutions because I'm, I'm so happy we're having this conversation, man. Uh, by the way, we loved your interview on, on uh, Theo Vaughn. Um, before we finish this call, I want to see what, you know, your future plans. Do you have a book coming out, uh, a website, things like that. But, um, but so far, a couple things that stand out under solutions because that's the main conversation that's being had on social media when we bring up the fact that hey it's an inconvenient truth but uh there's a crisis happening and people want to call me a sellout a coconut a vendido my malinche uncle tom uh you're just defending trump he called us rapists blah 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 i'm hearing congress is could could literally help put the kibosh on this thing messaging is there something else besides Congress funding some of these things and fixing the messaging? You know, those are the two key things. And I think the bigger thing, and, and you've got a very uh, large fan base, is we have to recognize that our elected officials work for us. And we have to get away from being so polarized. Um, except the fact that we do have a crisis. Now, whether you want to call it a crisis related to border security or humanitarian crisis, it's still a crisis and we have to accept that fact and rather than than uh, play with words and, and the semantics of it call it what it is it's a crisis we need to ask our elected officials to fix this and we need we need to hold them accountable because we haven't and and you know, as rob mentioned they, they kick this can and they, they kick it to the left and they kick it to the right and then they point fingers at each other something at the congressional level needs to be done and, and it needs to be done immediately let me the ask you this aspect is yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say the other aspect is, you know, a lot of the folks that are coming to our country, and so we need two parts of this. You know, the Biden administration and uh, Kamala Harris, our, our vice president, you know, she's she's missing in action. And, and very recently she said her, her role is to be diplomatic. And I understand that they want to look at the root causes of, of illegal migration. But that doesn't fix today. You know, we've we've got a dam that's broken and the water's flowing through the community, and they're looking at you know, building a casino down down on the river rather than focusing on fixing the dam today because you know they want to improve the economics down there. We need to address this problem. This administration needs to address this problem. Making an investment in other countries, absolutely, but we have to recognize that it, it will not fix the problem of today nor is it going to be tomorrow. It's probably 10, 15, or 20 years from now where that economic investment, that you know, that we plant that seed, that economic investment yields any sort of fruit for us. So until then, we have to design a system that can stem the flow, uh, make it more manageable. You know, and, and some of the things, if you look at uh, historically, uh, back in the, I think it was the late 40s through the 60s, the Barasero program, a lot of folks... You know what? If I'm from Mexico, and, and you know, it, it's the they're very very proud of their country, and rightly so. And they don't necessarily want to be here and live in the United States. They'd like to come here, make money, and go home. Because what we used to see a lot of that was it was cyclical. I show up, I would work for six months, make as much as I can, and then I would go home, and then I'd come back. If we could legalize that aspect from the work, the work permits, you know, whether it's a settle program or whatever it may be, I think that cur curtails some of the illegal migration we're dealing with because a lot of folks would come here, work, and go home. Um, we need to make 
applying easier. You know, we, everything we do, everybody has a cell phone to include the folks that are showing up at the border. Applying for, for some sort of legal status should be simple. Um, you shouldn't have to travel 2,000 or 10,000 miles across the world to show up at the border and subject yourself to the dangers of that trip. Uh, you know, the dangers of being trafficked, from being assaulted, to showing up at the border and trying to cross a river when you can't swim or coming to the desert when you're not prepared. Take that away by, by increasing the opportunities and the ability to apply for legal migration. <clears throat> Fix the immigration system so that we're looking at, and, and our country has changed and we don't, we don't need as much manual labor as we do technical labor, but you should still have the ability to increase the number of visas for both. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I'm trying to think of, so Congress, the messaging, I think us as constituents, we need to be vocal. And then the other part too is, you know, if you have the ability to reach back into, if you have family that's in Mexico or Central America, spread the word, you know, it, it, you're going to show up today and, and, and maybe everything works out well for you, but you, you, you're really putting yourself at risk. It, it's I'm going off on a tangent here because uh, as I think about this, I'm still amazed when I see little kids show up at the border by themselves. And, and I, I don't know if you saw the video of that young little boy who uh, down on Laredo who had been left by the group and, you know, he's crying and oh yeah, that happens. That happens all the time. And I, I wish we could demonstrate that to people because you're not, they're not, we as American citizens, we're not seeing this story play out every day. You know, you, from the little kids to the families to women that are raped to mm -hmm. people that are beat up because they, can, they couldn't pay their smuggling fee to it just the tragedies that you see at the border. It just plays out every day. And, and it's so easy for us to, to, to ignore it and then to get politicized with, I'm over here or I'm, I'm over here. Speaking yeah, of, so, really you know, so, so we've been talking about solutions, right? And let's just, I don't know if it's devil's advocate or what, but on our side, on the American side, who would benefit? Because we, we know, even if you're super well-versed or somewhat know that special interests and super PACs really do play a big part in Congress, right? And maybe why they've been sitting on the sidelines for so long. Who, in your opinion, if any, if you even have one, has an interest in us not revamping the mission, the, the the wording and not revamping the actual policy itself. Like who would benefit from yeah. a mess? Yeah, who who the benefits the most from this mess right now and not and letting decades go on without doing any of this? So a great question. And you know, we talk about um, <clears throat> the PACs and lobbyists and, and uh, businesses that benefit from it. So if you if you think back or if you look do do some research and, and I like the fact that you keep on stressing, do your research. Look at the at IRCA, uh, Immigration Reform and Control Act, uh, 1986, I believe, where that was supposed to be, that was under Ronald Reagan, that was supposed to be the fix, it was supposed to solve you know, illegal migration, legalized uh, millions of, of folks that have come here illegally, created avenues and pathways for them to get legal, uh, introduced worksite enforcement, and um, uh, temporary work, worker visas for different programs. Um, so work site enforcement never really took off. So when you talk about an entity that benefits from it, there are a lot of industries that benefit from it. So uh, in the late 80s, mid 90s, we used to do work site enforcement. Uh, in the last few years, go back five years, uh, ICE hit a, uh, it was a Tyson's chicken plant uh, somewhere in the, the uh, Midwest, Tennessee, Kentucky, I forget where, where it was. And there was something like seven or 800 um, undocumented people working there. That's a great example of an industry that benefits from this continued flow of workers because there, there's a constant flow of people coming in and out. It's a transitory workforce and it's a workforce that can be easily dis dispensed. I have problems with you. You're not here illegally. I fire you. I get rid of you. I threaten you and you're gone. So industries such as that, and I'm not saying it's just Tyson's as a whole, uh, please don't, don't hold me accountable for Tyson's, but industries of that nature, um, uh, tourism industries, such as, uh, I hate to say it, but the, look at Las Vegas. Behind the scenes, what is making that function? People that are cooking and cleaning and, and doing all the, the work behind the scenes. A lot of those are folks that are that are here uh, illegally uh, or have just recently migrated. So as it relates to lobbyists, the work industry, um, and then there's always this, 
Now, now, whether it's factual or not, there's this perception that if you come here illegally or you recently migrate, that you're automatically going to be a Democrat. Um, because a lot of the, the uh, careers that these folks get into are unionized. And unfortunately, I think a lot of our unions tend to lean towards uh, the, the Democratic Party. And so there's, there's that perception that um, if you stem this flow or this population that's coming in, you're, you're going to impede your ability to, to generate a larger Democratic base in the future. So, you know, when you, when you talk about the industries, I would look at uh, food processing, tourism, uh, and uh, some of the unions that are looking at these particular types of folks that are going to, to uh, join their membership. Very interesting. Urca, 1986. Mm. We, we got to look that up. Yeah, I remember hearing about the Tyson uh, uh, raid, I guess. They did one here in Houston at a Shipley Donuts. Um, and obviously the sad story that comes with it is, you know, mom and dad go to work. Mom and dad don't come home. What happens to these kids? Next thing you know, people protesting saying abolish ICE. Mm -hmm. So I know ICE is a whole other department and they get their own set of... Uh, a bad rep um how does the border patrol work with ice and and what can you tell us a little bit about ice and and this sentiment to want to uh, what would happen if they abolished ice so we have to recognize that ice um they're, they're not a one-trick pony they're very diverse in the things that, that they're focused on um, from narcotic trafficking to trafficking of people to illegal migration to um uh counter gangs, um, your terrorists, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, sex exploitation, child, uh, child uh, pornography and stuff like that. So they've got a very diverse um, uh, focus as it, you know, when it relates. It's not just uh, the illegal migra uh, migrant portion. I, I think, unfortunately, if you get rid of ICE, you end up allowing a lot of folks in, in don't get me wrong. I think I would say 90%, probably even 95% of those that are coming here illegally are, are wonderful people. But you still have 5 to 10% that have criminal backgrounds or their intentions are, are anything but beneficial to the United States. So you take away ICE and you remove the ability to go after those people uh, because the Border Patrol stays focused at the border. You know, we're not going into the cities. We're not but we stay at the border. And so ICE's job is to handle everything else within the interior of the United States. Um, the sex trafficking, um, indentured servitude, child pornography, all that stuff is, is, is real. And that's a lot of what ICE deals with. Wow. Yeah, we cannot abolish ICE. <laughs> Just the fact that everything from people trafficking, narcotics, terrorists, things like that, um, if I'm not mistaken, Houston, Houston, Texas is the human trafficking capital of the U.S. Um, could we talk about human trafficking a little bit for a second? What can you tell us about that? Yeah, you, you know, it's it is the gosh, it's the unseen crime because it happens right under our noses. Um, <clears throat> anytime you're traveling and going through an airport, I, I assure you, and, and, and because you're trained in it and, and uh, we deal with it. Sometimes you'll see it. It's happening right under, under under the noses of most of America, where people are being trafficked into the U.S. and across the U.S. from city to city for whether it's prostitution, child pornography, and in some cases it's simply indentured servitude. You know, I, I mentioned a, an Indian national paying forty to eighty thousand dollars to be smuggled into the U.S. A lot of these folks don't have that money, so what what happens to them? They're indentured to work it off, and you know it's three years, five years, ten years of hard labor. The, um, you know, one of the things I, I failed to mention is uh, with these unaccompanied children in the family units, two years, uh, two years ago, it's 2019, one of the things that was happening was the trafficking of children in that male adults would show up with a, a, ch a child and pretend that was their kid. And what they did was they rented this child because they knew that they would be released. And so we, at one point we had, it was like 3,800 children that we identified that had been looped into this who are being rented or trafficked you know and some of them you're able to pull out of that system and others by the time you recognize what what happened they've already been released and they're gone and that, that's part of the problem too is when you have the the this magnitude of a population if i show up and i've got a little boy with me or a little girl 
and I, you know, I don't have the staff to focus on looking for the anomalies, th- things that, excuse me, things that seem out of the ordinary. I may not pick up on it, you know, unless it's blatant. Uh, one of the cases we had, we had a, a young man, I think he's 24, something like that. He had an eight-year-old baby with him, still in diapers, had no idea how to care for it, and, and you could you could tell by, I mean, simply from how he's holding it. So he would just leave the, the baby on the concrete and walk away. and was talking to other people. You know, as a very astute agent who looked at it and said, you know, that's, that's wrong. Started talking to him and realized that, yeah, all he did was rent the baby. Hmm. And we asked him, what were you going to do with the baby once you got released? He said, I was just going to leave it forever. I figured I'd leave it uh, at a church or something and somebody would take care of it. You know? So you hear stories like this and it just breaks your heart because you're thinking, this poor child, and who would have rented their baby to somebody? But it happens. And, and God forbid you have to do a, uh, you have to separate that 24 year old from this child just to verify if they're really family. Maybe DNA testing or something like that. And then here comes the media and the politicians saying, ripped away, children ripped away from their <laughs> parents' arms. And that's what we call the okie doke. Here on uh, Red Pill Tamales, uh, we know that we have to sift through a lot of this uh, misinformation and just like, I didn't know ICE dealt with terrorists. I didn't know ICE was going after, uh, you know, um, the, you know, people that deal with the, the child, you know, pornography and stuff like that. Um, So just to recap uh, to everyone that's tuning in, we're asking questions. Uh, Mr. Villarreal served our country 32 years at the United States border patrol. Uh, We're actually getting answers. We're getting solutions. Citizens need to be more vocal. Um, This administration needs to fix the messaging. Um, Elected officials work for us. Let's not be so polarized. Um, Make the application for uh, legal status a little bit easier, maybe an app or something, uh, and we can reference the Bracero program. Um, Congress. Congress controls the purse and the legislation. They can, uh, I guess, help fund the things that are needed. And, And just to backtrack a little bit, the rhetoric that I, I apologize, sir. Thank you for your service because I was part of the problem of this rhetoric of you know la migra, la migra this, and you know you know. Uh, That's what uh, po- point at the poster. Yeah, I used to say stuff like la migra me la pela, stuff like that. No offense, sir. Um, <laughs> but you know, I was young, stupid, and it's easy to fall into this rhetoric of abolish ICE, and and now you have this anti-police rhetoric that I also do not participate in. Um, but a lot, I think a lot of our youth is lost. Um, they somehow have fallen into someone's larger agenda um, because as we've established, we know who could benefit from abolishing ICE and, and talking bad about the immigration. It's like it's only going to lead for problems for I don't care if you're a Chicano, if you're a United States citizen, if you're an American, um, all of these things are tearing away at our sovereignty, our ability to provide for actual citizens um, the amount of pressure being put on these border towns and just e- other communities. I mean, people are getting shipped to New York, uh, Maryland, D.C., Chicago, all over the place. Um, I, I, j- I just well, want to recap. Uh-huh. That's one of the key things you just mentioned. Uh, nothing stops at the border. It, you know, that impact at the border, it, there's, there is an impact and it's, tra- it's temporary, but everything transitions through the border. So your, your fentanyl, your meth, your coke, the people that are coming through here. Not everybody's staying here. They're, it's it gets spread throughout the entire United States. Um, you know, I was surprised because I, I deal with the the, the consuls and uh, the Mexican consul, the Guatemalan consul, and the Salvadoran consul are telling me that they're establishing offices in Kentucky and Tennessee and Ohio, places that they had never dreamed of of having constituents there. And why? Because a lot of folks are now migrating into places like this. So, you know, if you're if you're in Middle America or you're in back east and you think that this this does not impact you, you are naively wrong. It, anything that happens to the border eventually is going to touch our entire country. Absolutely. Let's talk, since, uh, since we brought up Congress and we talked about solutions and stuff, we didn't bring up uh, the gaps that they're talking about filling in now. And I know you had mentioned that previously on other, or with Theo especially, but... The wall? The wall, right? So the wall, the rebuilding of or filling in of the wall and other technical support and other devices you guys might have. Can you explain to the audience what you didn't have before and what you had or what rather what you had under Trump and what you don't have now or what you didn't have even before Trump and then gained and then what Biden kind of needs to do here in the sense of finishing wall and, and giving you guys things that you need. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so um, when people think about the border and if, if you haven't traveled and I hope you do, but anytime you travel into any country, 
you need a passport. Um, and then we're not the only country in the world that has border security, whether it's fencing technology. Um, in some parts of the country, it goes beyond that. Uh, I've, I've entertained um, uh, officials from Egypt and, and places like that where they use, it, you know, it's border security for them is truly national security and that they're using the military. So they've got landmines and people manning, you know, machine guns and posts. So if you look throughout the, the entire world, you're going to notice that border security is a reality. It exists for everyone. It's not just the U.S. And it varies from the way it's done here all the way up to a, a, a military apparatus. Um, <clears throat> so for us, for the border, it's, it's not militarized. You know, we, there aren't landmines, there aren't trained dogs hunting people down, there aren't sniper nests, anything of that nature. It was in uh, under the Clinton administration that we really began to focus on border security. And up until that point, uh, you know, I started in late 88 and through the mid 90s, you could go down to the border. And the only thing you were going to see if you saw anything was uh, a couple strands of barbed wire. And anywhere there may have been an urbanized area, maybe there's a chain link fence up there. But other than that, there really was no demarcation between U.S. and Mexico. So under the Clinton administration is when we began to focus on demarcating the border. And it was something very simple. They, they, we used um, old steel landing mat from the Vietnam era. And uh, we, this was done principally by border agents who had construction backgrounds or engineering backgrounds. And we sent teams out there and they would put this steel landing mat up and, and you know, you'd build a border fence. Or as we now, it's called the border wall, but, you know, fence wall, one of the same. And it serves a purpose. You know, one, it, it's a demarcation of the border. Secondly, it, it uh, creates the ability to, it, for, for, and I'm speaking for the Border Patrol, it creates the ability to funnel that flow of illegal migration into areas that are more easily managed and controlled. Because the last thing you want to do is, is sit here with a wide open range and, and, and just like a, you know, you're running left and right and all over the place. If you can build fencing and you can funnel that flow to a point where then you can use ground sensors and cameras and infrared technology so that you can then zero in and make the arrest easier, why not? You work smarter. So from the mid nineties through the early two thousands, the border patrol, there was a transition to our philosophy went from being reactive. All we did was we reacted to people coming across the border to being proactive. So one of the things you have to recognize is that when we talk about border fencing, really what it is, it's an enforcement system. Because to put up a fence, you need to have access to the border. So now that means you have a road. So now agents can drive to the border and they can patrol along the border. So then you put the wall up, then you have border roads, now you put lights up so now you can see what's going on. Maybe you run power out there because now you can put up cameras, uh, you can put ground sensors in. So it's this complete border enforcement system. And the ability to patrol the, the road is, is, that in and of itself is a tremendous benefit to the, to the border patrol. So here in Tucson, I had segments of the border where, again, it was 260 miles with, with Mexico. And they would take my agents driving from Tucson or Casa Grande, two hours just to get to the border. And in some cases, they would get to the border and then have to respond to like a, a camera or a ground sensor going off. We'd either have to drive another hour because there's no road along the border to mm. respond to that or hike up a mountain. So when we put new new wall up, what that did was it created a border road that now my agents, instead of what took them an hour, now takes them 10 minutes to traverse across the border. And then it also addresses, you know, what I mentioned the, how the, the cartels are chartering these buses. Now when they're dropped off in some of these locations, now I have, I have the ability, I should say the Border Patrol has the ability to drive immediately to those locations because there's a border road there. So when you look at, at border enforcement, it's border wall, it's roads, it's technology. And um, I'm going to date myself here, but when I first started, the Border Patrol was sort of like the Flintstones. You know, we, everything was old manual typewriters. You know, if you had a, a, uh, a uh, criminal database, it was on a three-by-five card that you kept in your station, and I had your picture and your, your fingerprints on there. So now you fast forward and we're in the Jetson era. Everything is computerized. So you know now we've got your fingerprints, there's facial recognition. So if you enter in California or you enter in New York, I know who you are because you're in there. And the other aspect too is um, when uh, we're involved in the conflicts in the Middle East 
And, uh, sorry. And we deal with, um, and I apologize, so I'm trying to think this through to make sure that I'm not, I'm not uh, violating any uh, classification, classified information. Um, but the government does, does capture information from people that, that want to harm us. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to use that very loosely so that I don't, I don't jeopardize myself here. Sure. And so when we talk about border security, everybody who comes across, and like I said, 90, 95% of them are great people, fingerprinted, photographed, so we can identify who you are. And we're tapped into some databases in other countries. Those individuals, and, and um, thankfully there, it's not a huge pool, but there are those individuals who have terrorist ties. They've been trained or they're recruiters or financiers for, for terrorism. Um, they come across the southern border. Uh, you know, the number's not tremendous, but when you look at 9-11, it was a handful of people that changed our lives. So it doesn't take a lot. So, the, the, so again... Important man today. <laughs> I apologize. I'm trying to turn off the ringer. Give me one second. I apologize. No, no worries. Jingo's phone goes off at least once an episode. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, okay, so so the border fencing, the roads, the technology, which is everything from ground sensors to infrared cameras. Um, you know, we're always evolving, moving forward. So with our cameras, now we're using artificial intelligence because when you think about the border, if I just use Tucson, 260 miles, a multitude of cameras a single individual watching one camera or four cameras may be feasible, but when you talk about 10, 20, 50 cameras, impossible. So we start, we've started to use artificial intelligence, which is looking at change detection. Um, that, that's the principle underneath it. So now what happens is something changes within that screen and then it notifies the, the operator. He or she takes a look, look at it and they'll investigate it and they'll dispatch somebody to it. Whereas back in the day when a ground sensor went off, you just, you know, you, as an agent would have to respond to it. It could be cattle, uh, coyotes, mountain lions, or a group of backpackers. Um, so, you know, we've, we've really moved forward as it relates to technology. And the fact that now we're tied into databases that we weren't tied into before is tremendous. So the ability to identify somebody who's got a criminal record um, or who may have a terrorist tie and or establish a record for down the road. One of the things you have to look at, you know, we talked about um, the dreamers. And this is one of the things that, that really uh, upset me the most. I, I agree. I think that, that uh, individuals who were brought here as kids and have lived their entire lives here thinking either they were U.S. citizens or have been so embedded in the, our way of life should be legal, should be legalized. But here's another issue with Congress. They could have fixed this. It could have been done years ago. Um, but everybody's playing with this because they're using it for, for political banter. You know, they're on that soapbox. The left doesn't want to do it or the right doesn't want to do it. This could have been fixed and it should have been fixed. But I use the dreamers as an example. When Congress passes legislation, they usually say, hey, so on or before X date, you must have entered the country or you must have applied for X, Y, and Z. Well, part of what we do when we, when we, when we process you, and it's just like any, any arrest, everybody's processed, right? You're booked in. We're creating a record. So as a dreamer, you could come back and say, well, you know what? I, I entered the country back in... 2000, and I remember coming into the, with the Border Patrol. Well, now they can go and write your record and say, oh, no, sure enough, Roy entered as a, as a seven-year-old kid back in 2000, so he does qualify to be a dreamer. So so ironically, from a booking slash criminal record, there's also the possibility of legal uh, benefit. So, you know, again, Flintstones to the Jetsons, we just improved so much. Uh, the other thing that we look at when we talk about technology is um, – CBP, which is the umbrella agency for the Border Patrol, Customs and Border Protection handles the folks who are at the ports of entry. You know, those are the guys that are guys and gals wearing blue that when you drive up, you know, you present your U.S. citizen or your, your documents. And the Border Patrol, which are the guys in green that are working between the ports of entry out in the desert and the mountains. CBP has is the largest federal law enforcement agency in, in the system. It's got over 60,000 um, sworn law enforcement officers, 20,000 are border agents, and then 40,000 are your OFO officers. So they work at the land ports of entry all throughout the United States, at your airports. You know, when you fly in from 
from Europe or Cancun or whatever, those are the people you're talking to. It also has the largest air fleet, um, police law enforcement air fleet in the, in the U.S. government for enforcement purposes. Uh, you know, the Coast Guard's probably larger than us, but they're they're not doing um, uh, police work. So CBP, largest law enforcement entity, largest uh, air fleet. And with that air fleet, you've got helicopters, uh, airplanes, um, unmanned aerial vehicles, you know, so... It, at any given time along the border, there's probably at least two uh, unmanned aerial vehicles that are up in the air at you know, 40, 60,000 feet surveilling the border and using using technology for, for uh, tracking or monitoring what's going on. So a lot of stuff, a lot of types of technology that are in play here. Wow. Thank you for spreading the word and getting the word out because um, a lot of people that like to have an opinion about uh, border patrol or immigration or whatever they don't even know what coyotes are they don't even know they don't even understand the term coyote um they don't they don't comprehend the impact but uh thank you so much for the work that you do um that's definitely shout out your social media uh, do you have any projects or, or anything that you'd like to uh let the world know about yeah you know so one of the things it, and i thank you for the opportunity uh one of the things i've noticed is is that there is a lot of misinformation out there and so uh, what I recently did is, uh, and I'll send you, I think I'm on Instagram here. And as Rob will tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm new to social media. I've, I've had teams working for me, so I've never had to handle it other than show up and <laughs> speak or take a picture or something like that. But uh, I, I'm, on, I'm, I'm on Instagram and I'm getting on Twitter. And what I plan on doing is um, getting information out there because there's just so much information about what's misinformation about what people think is happening when it's actually not happening. And uh, for me right now, it's the Biden administration because I, I really think that every decision they've made thus far is a bad decision. Uh, they haven't made an effort to talk to the experts. Uh, they, I think they'd be surprised if they took the time to talk to the experts that uh, they, they would get solutions that aren't all about enforcement. But uh, I'm on uh, as Chief uh, Roy Villarreal on Instagram and uh, on Twitter, I'm Roy Villarreal CPA. And I'll send you that information, but my intent is to put information out so that you can make an informed decision. Uh, you can be aware of, you know, the media may say one thing, but there is always a reality behind it. Because whenever you're dealing with the media, the you know, unfortunately, it's so inflammatory. It, it wants to be sold. It wants to be driven. And, and so it, it's going to point you in one direction or the other. So I'm a, my effort is to get as much information out as possible. And the other thing, too, is, um, you know, we talk about La media and there's that perception of, you know, just cold-hearted guys out there that you know don't care the agents out there make every effort to treat everyone as humanely as possible I mean, I, I can't count the times that uh it doesn't look like it now after 32 years but when you give up your lunch or you drive through at mcdonald's and you're picking up happy meals for the kids or or people you have in custody who haven't eaten in days um the rescues you know we're rescuing people every day and as the summer months kick into effect we go from an enforcement mode into a rescue mode. You know, one of the things that I, I think is overlooked is a lot of entities, sheriffs, police departments lack the capability, nor do they want the responsibility of performing these rescues. So here in Tucson last year alone, something like 2,000 people formed 2,000 rescues. And uh, it, it's just, it's an everyday effort and we're, we're doing as, as best as we can, but I appreciate you making the time to, to get the word out and. Um, if I can do anything to offer up uh, more insight or if, if we can get you into maybe one of the facilities or come out and do a border tour, I'd love to do that because uh, it's one thing to have a conversation. It's one thing to be on the ground, see the border, uh, talk to agents, talk to some of the migrants that have just come across because it really broadens your perspective on what's happening. Yeah, I hope to do this regularly, actually. Maybe you can be the resident, you know, Border Patrol information captain here for the TIA, as we call them, the Tamal Intelligence Agency. Do it monthly or quarterly or whatever, you know, is, is good for your schedule. Sounds great. I'd love to do it. And like I said, I, I appreciate the opportunity. And it's, uh, we really need to do more to get educated, but we really do need to do more to fix this because my biggest concern, and I, and I focus on border security because it's what I did for so long, but I also think about the people coming across. And, and as we enter the summer months with these kids and families, tragically what we're going to see, and if you think, Think about this. It was in two years ago that the father and that little boy that drowned in the river. Mm. It's going to happen again. Uh, last year, we had a, a mom and a child from India 
the, the, the child died in the desert. Yeah. It's going to happen again. And so, you know, for, for me, it, it boils down to all this is preventable. Uh, so, you know, I thank you for, for the opportunity to get out and speak about it. Well, thank you. Keep up the great work. We're going to definitely follow you. We're going to encourage everyone to follow you so you can keep uh, informing us and, and clarifying things. And uh, I feel like this was very productive. Uh, thank you so much, man. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, I'll have all your information in the show notes. And uh, we'll encourage everybody to follow you on, on our Patreon and on iTunes and our Instagram and Spotify. And everybody hopefully follows you. Sounds great. Appreciate it, guys. All right, awesome. brother. Have a great day. Thank you. Keep up the great work. Thank, thank you. you.